Bien, bonjour tout le monde. Euh, merci beaucoup d'être ici euh, aujourd'hui en si grand nombre. Ça fait vraiment un plaisir de vous retrouver ici. Hello everyone, welcome to all. Uh, it is a great pleasure to see you all in person. And uh, before I begin, I would like to acknowledge uh, that we are gathered here today in Ottawa on the traditional lands of the Algonquin and Anishinaabek peoples. And I would like to thank, un grand merci, Sylvain Charbonneau, Lucie Thibault, Daniel, Jean-Daniel Jacob, uh, pour votre, uh, votre accueil si chaleureux, your warm welcome on this beautiful campus, my alma mater, the University of Ottawa. And I also would like to thank my colleagues, uh, Minister Bennett, Minister Duclos, and Kamal. <laughs> I always call you Kamal. Minister Kara for being here today. As you know, uh, Minister Bennett is the Minister of Mental Health and Addictions and Associate Minister of Health. The Honorable Kamal Kara is Minister of Seniors and they're joining us today. Et donc, je veux évidemment souhaiter la bienvenue à mon collègue, le ministre Jean-Yves Duclos, député de la magnifique ville de Québec et ministre de la Santé. Alors, vous savez, c'est une importante annonce aujourd'hui et je suis très heureuse d'être parmi vous pour la faire. J'inviterai maintenant M. Sylvain Charbonneau de pouvoir venir prendre la parole. Merci, M. Charbonneau. Merci, Madame la ministre. Merci, cher Mona. Tu es toujours bienvenue sur le campus de l'Université d'Ottawa. Bonjour tout le monde. Je m'appelle Sylvain Charbonneau. Je suis vice-recteur à la recherche et à l'innovation ici même à l'Université d'Ottawa. Je suis, je suis ravi de vous accueillir sur notre campus Lise cet après-midi dans un de nos laboratoires de simulation en sciences infirmières. Lorsque nous nous réussissons pour un événement d'envergure comme celui-ci, nous avons coutume d'offrir une affirmation autochtone en plus aux efforts de réconciliation. Nous rendons hommage au peuple algonquin, gardien, de terre de, gardien traditionnel de cette terre. Nous reconnaissons le lien sacré de longue date l'unissant à ce territoire qui demeure jusqu'à ce jour non cédé. We pay respect to all indigenous people in this region from all nations across Canada who call Ottawa home. We acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old. And we honor their courageous leaders, past, present, and future. J'aimerais souhaiter la bienvenue aux quatre milices présents aujourd'hui pour faire une annonce importante qui touche sur le soin de la santé au pays. Je suis honoré de vous présenter le ministre de la Santé, Jean-Yves Duclos, Minister of Mental Health and Action, Addiction and Associate Ministers of Health, Carolyn Bennett, and Minister of Seniors, Kamal Kira. I also would like to acknowledge the presence of Brendan Hanley, MP of the Yukon. The pandemic has reminded us of the importance of having a strong healthcare system. At the University of Ottawa, we are proud of our contributions to Canadian healthcare. We also are proud of our contributions to the fight against COVID-19. In fact, in this very building, we hosted a community, a community testing clinic. Our medical and nursing schools are amongst the top in the country. Hundreds of physicians, nurses, and nurse practitioners graduate every year to meet the needs of communities in both official languages. Ministers Duclos, Bennett, Kira, and Fortin I am pleased to say that we will be expanding our contributions through the new School of Pharmaceutical Sciences, the only francophone school outside of the province of Quebec. We are building a new campus here on Lease Avenue to honor our nursing, nutrition sciences and rehabilitation sciences program under the same roof because we know the patient care improves when health care providers get together. Here at the University of Ottawa, our aim is to conduct tangible research combined with experiential learning. We ensure our graduates have the agility and skills they will need to excel in the ever-changing landscape, where the use of data, technology, and innovation to treat patients continuously grows and effective health delivery models evolves. 
Les besoins en matière de professionnels de la santé vont continuer de croître à l'avenir. Chaque année, 100 de nos 350 diplômés en sciences infirmières obtiennent un emploi et un bon nombre avant même, de le, avant même la fin de leurs études. Nos formations sont d'autant plus importantes pour les communautés franco-ontariennes puisque 90 des professionnels de la santé francophones bilingues dans la province ont été formés chez nous. C'est un rôle que nous, qui nous tient à cœur. En terminant, je voudrais vous remercier d'avoir choisi l'Université d'Ottawa pour votre annonce d'aujourd'hui. Vous êtes toujours les bienvenus chez nous et nous espérons vous voir à l'ouverture de notre nouvel édifice de, la santé, de sciences de la santé à l'automne de 2023. J'invite maintenant le ministre Duclos à prendre la parole. Monsieur Duclos. Merci beaucoup, M. Charbonneau. Merci, Sylvain. Bonjour tout le monde. Uh, greetings, everyone. And thank you all for being here today. We just had a wonderful exchange with young students here at the nursing school of the University of Ottawa, where you might be happy to know, Mona, I also studied, but uh, in economics, many years ago. These young Canadians are focused, dedicated, and determined to provide the best possible care to their fellow citizens, and so is our government. Today, I'm joined by my dear colleagues, Minister Bennett and Minister Kera, and I also want, obviously, to acknowledge the presence and the leadership of Minister Fortier, as well as MP Brendan Hanley. We have some very important news to share for Canadians and their family today. Our announcement is twofold. First, we have news to share with regards to surgical backlogs, and second, we will briefly lay out our vision for the future of federal and provincial collaboration on healthcare in Canada. Comme nous le savons tous, les deux dernières années ont été éprouvantes pour notre système de santé, pour nos travailleurs de la santé et pour les patients, particulièrement pour nos aînés et leurs familles à travers tout le pays. Dans plusieurs cas, la pandémie a mis en lumière des problèmes qui existaient déjà depuis de nombreuses années et elle a rendu les choses encore plus difficiles. In many cases, the pandemic has brought to light problems that have already existed for many years and made things even more difficult. This is particularly true in the case of delays for surgeries, diagnostics and treatments of all kinds. This problem was not and is not new, but the pandemic has contributed to exacerbating it even more acutely. These delays are a burden that can be very, can be very hard to bear for the affected patients, their families and their loved ones, as well as for the healthcare workers caring for them. Imagine for a moment that you were diagnosed with cancer, recommended surgery, and that when the time comes, you're informed that your surgery must be postponed. The reality is that for lack of time, lack of staff, and lack of space available to operate, too many of our fellow citizens have suffered and are still suffering this ordeal. Ces délais n'ont pas seulement un impact sur la santé des gens à court et à long terme, ils ont un impact aussi sur le stress des familles et de leurs proches, mais aussi sur le stress de notre, notre personnel de santé qui est au front depuis près de deux ans. Cela ne devrait tout simplement pas se produire en, au Canada en 2022. In 2022, this should simply not be happening in Canada. Today, on behalf of the federal government, we are pleased to announce an investment of $2 billion to help our provincial and territorial partners significantly reduce the backlog of surgeries delayed because of COVID-19. This major investment could help provinces and territories clearing hundreds of thousands of backlog surgeries, such as cancer and heart surgeries or hip replacements. These amounts will be transferred to our provincial and territorial partners through a one-time top-up of the Canada Health Transfer. This is a significant first step on the road to addressing the major healthcare challenges ahead of us. In addition to the $4 billion for backlogs announced in March 2021, today's announcement will help repair the damage caused to our healthcare system by the pandemic. 
It is also setting us on the longer term path towards ensuring that our healthcare system can meet the structural and demographic challenges of the 21st century. In order to do this, we will want to work collaboratively with our provincial and territorial partners and focus on the needs of patients and the achievements of concrete outcomes. Although it is not over yet, we already can and must learn from the pandemic. Même si elle n'est pas encore terminée, nous pouvons et nous devons tirer des leçons de cette pandémie. Dès maintenant, nous pouvons et nous devons protéger notre système de santé public et universel, un système de santé qui respecte certains principes fondamentaux tels qu'ils sont édictés dans la loi canadienne sur la santé, un système basé sur la gestion publique, l'intégralité des soins, l'universalité, la transférabilité et l'accessibilité. We sometimes forget it, or may take it for granted, but several decades ago in Canada, we made the choice to have a public and universal health care system. Collectively, as a country, we've made the choice to leave no one behind and to need and to deny no one necessary care, regardless of status or ability to pay. Permettez-moi de faire un petit détour historique pour vous raconter très brièvement comment nous en sommes collectivement arrivés à faire ce choix. At the national level, not without a good deal of inspiration from the health insurance of the late, that the late Tommy Douglas helped put in place in Saskatchewan, we first made this choice under the leadership of the government of Louis Saint Laurent with the passage of the Federal Hospital Insurance and Diagnostic Services Act in 1957. For the first time in our history, then, the idea of publicly funded healthcare became law. For the first time in our history, Canadians could go to the hospital without fear of bankruptcy or, even worse, not being cared for because they couldn't afford it. Pour la première fois de notre histoire, l'idée donc d'un financement public des soins de santé devenait loi. A few years later, in 1966, the Federal Medical Care Act was introduced before finally being signed in 1968. Avec cette loi, pour la première fois, le principe d'universalité était codifié dans une loi canadienne applicable d'un océan à l'autre. En échange de la garantie que les provinces et les territoires respecteraient ces principes, le gouvernement fédéral s'engageait alors à rembourser aux provinces et aux territoires une partie de leurs dépenses en santé. In 1977, the Federal Provincial Fiscal Arrangements and Established Programs Financing Act also known as EPF, was passed. Au lieu de se faire rembourser leurs dépenses de santé au fur et à mesure, les provinces et les territoires obtenaient du gouvernement canadien un engagement et un financement annuel en bloc, et le fédéral acceptait de réduire ses taux d'imposition pour permettre aux provinces d'augmenter les leurs afin de financer leurs soins de santé. This long road culminated in 1984 with the unanimous adoption of the Canada Health Act, to which I referred a little earlier. Now, why this long detour? Because today, almost 40 years after the adoption of the Canada Health Act, and two years after the beginning of the worst pandemic our world has known in over a century, we need to acknowledge that if we do not act quickly and decisively, the long-term survival of the universal and public health system Canadians cherish so much is at risk. Fortunately, over the course of the last two years, the pandemic has shown what we can achieve when all levels of government work together. Grâce aux investissements annoncés aujourd'hui, de nombreuses personnes à travers le pays pourront plus facilement et plus rapidement accéder aux traitements chirurgicaux dont ils ont besoin. C'est une excellente nouvelle, mais nous voulons aussi être lucides. While today's announcement is great news, we know that much more needs to be done. Les défis auxquels nous faisons face maintenant demandent une action concertée et collaborative de la part de notre gouvernement et des gouvernements provinciaux et territoriaux. Avec les années, 
le contexte démographique, les, le contexte sociosanitaire et le contexte environnemental mettront de plus en plus de pression sur nos systèmes de santé. Le vieillissement de la population a pour effet à la fois d'augmenter les besoins et de réduire la disponibilité de nos travailleurs de la santé. Tous les experts le constatent. Nous faisons et ferons aussi face à une augmentation des maladies chroniques, des maladies rares, une augmentation du coût des différentes technologies, du coût des médicaments, sans oublier les effets de plus, en, de plus en plus importants des changements climatiques sur la santé des gens et de la population. When addressing these significant challenges, Canadians are not interested in a jurisdictional debate or fiscal or financial fight. Patients wanting waiting for surgeries and families hoping to gain access to family health services want results. They want care. As promised during the election campaign and as often repeated since, our government wants to work in collaboration with provinces and territories to deliver results for Canadians, their families and for our health care workers. Aujourd'hui, nous voulons offrir publiquement notre collaboration à toutes les provinces et à tous les territoires. Canadians are not interested in a sterile fiscal debate. I'll say it again. Canadians are interested in results. They want care. In the wise words of the Honorable Monique Bégin, whom I, meet, whom I met just a few weeks ago, former Federal Minister of Health and mother of the Canada Health Act. Here's what she said many years ago, and she's still extremely lucid and following that very closely. Nothing is more unproductive in Canada than a numbers war between two levels of government. Il n'y a rien de plus productif, de plus contre-productif au Canada qu'une guerre de chiffres entre deux paliers de gouvernement. I'm an, I'm an economist and I love numbers, but even I don't care much for a numbers war. Ces débats, ces débats fiscaux et financiers sont toujours stériles. Bien entendu, cette collaboration doit s'exercer dans le respect des juridictions et des compétences de chacun des paliers des gouvernements, y compris des, du gouvernement des provinces et des territoires. Elle doit aussi être axée sur la responsabilité partagée de chacun et mettre l'accent sur les résultats. C'est ce que j'appelle la règle des trois R. Respect, responsabilité, résultat. I call it the rule of the three R's. Respect, responsibility and results. Respect for jurisdictions, shared responsibility and focus on results. Comme je l'ai décrit lors du petit détour historique que nous avons pris un peu plus tôt, le gouvernement canadien a joué un rôle déterminant il y a de nombreuses années dans la création de notre système de santé public et universel et nous avons tous un rôle à jouer pour maintenir cette universalité et cette accessibilité. Je le répète, il en va de la survie à long terme notre système de santé public et universel. In our conversation with Canadians and in our conversations with provinces and territories, we have heard that in order to ensure the long-term strength of the health system, our collaborative work should focus on five fundamental areas of priorities. The first of these five priorities is the one that relates to delays in treatments, diagnosis and surgeries, and which is inextricably linked to the critical issue of how we treat healthcare workers. The investments we've announced, we've just announced, will allow significant progress But if we want to uphold the principles of universality and accessibility that are dear to all Canadians, we must better support healthcare workers. We must, must find ways to attract and retain more of them, like the brave students we just met today here at the University of Ottawa. The second area of priorities relates to access to family health services, also known as primary care. More than 4.5 million Canadians are still looking for better access to family health services. Ces services sont pourtant essentiels, à la fois en matière de prévention en santé et en matière d'accessibilité à des soins de santé appropriés, efficaces et équitables. La troisième priorité concerne les soins de longue durée et les soins à domicile. 
With our rapidly aging population, we know that the long-term care and home care needs of a growing part of our population will only increase. La pandémie nous a aussi cruellement rappelé que nos services de soins de longue durée et des soins à domicile ont besoin d'être soutenus. Ils ont besoin d'être soutenus afin de nous assurer que nos aînés et les personnes en situation de handicap puissent vivre en sécurité et en dignité. En effet, s'il est établi que nous avons maintenant le droit de mourir dans la dignité, nos aînés aussi devraient avoir le droit de vivre et de vieillir dans la dignité. Indeed, while it is now established in Canada that we should all have the right to die with dignity, our elders must also have the right to live and age in dignity. My colleague, Minister Kara, is already very hard at work on these issues, and I know she will have more to say in just a few minutes. The fourth area of priority relates to mental, he mental health and substance use. Depuis quelques années, certains des tabous les plus tenaces en matière de santé mentale tombent et la santé mentale prend davantage de place, davantage la place qui lui revient dans l'espace public. La pandémie a aussi eu des impacts considérables sur la santé mentale de nombreux Canadiens. Nos systèmes de santé doivent prendre acte de ces changements et de ces impacts et disposer des ressources nécessaires pour faire face aux défis que cela amène. De plus, en matière de dépendance et de toxicomanie, la crise des opioïdes qui continue à sévir dans l'ombre doit elle aussi retenir davantage notre attention. My colleague, Minister Bennett, has always shown tremendous leadership and has been showing tremendous leadership over the last few months on these issues, will continue to do so, and she will have a few things to say in a few minutes on that. Finally, digital health and virtual care must also be at the heart of our collaboration with provincial and territorial partners. In 2022, it is not normal that from one hospital to another, from one city to another, or from one province to another, Canadians are un unable to access and consult their own medical records in one and the same place. Now, these five priorities are obviously not exhaustive, but in terms of delivering concrete outcomes for Canadians, they represent the fundamental basis on which we want to continue working with provincial and territorial partners in addition to dental care and the rising cost of medicines. S'il y a une chose que les deux dernières années de pandémie ont réussi à démontrer, c'est qu'avec de la bonne volonté et beaucoup de travail, la nature fédérative de notre pays peut apporter des bienfaits considérables. We have demonstrated our ability to do this on a number of occasions over the course of our history, and even more so over the course of the last two years in the context of the pandemic. We've demonstrated this in housing with 13 different bilateral agreements. We are demonstrating it on childcare. We have demonstrated, demonstrated it with the delivery of billions of items of protecting but the personal protective equipment and millions of vaccines. Nous l'avons démontré avec l'appui des forces armées canadiennes dans les centres de soins de longue durée. We continue to demonstrate this with the supply and administration of antivirals. Et nous continuons à le démontrer avec l'approvisionnement et la distribution de centaines de millions de tests rapides. Since the beginning of the pandemic, our government has also invested $63 billion in the health of Canadians. À cela s'ajoute 3 milliards de dollars pour des ententes bilatérales en matière de soins de longue durée, 3 milliards de dollars pour des ententes bilatérales sur la santé mentale et 3 milliards de dollars pour des ententes bilatérales sur les soins à domicile. Nous avons d'ailleurs très hâte de négocier ces ententes avec tous nos partenaires des provinces et des territoires. Finalement, il ne faut pas oublier non plus les 45 milliards de dollars que représente le transfert canadien en santé en 2022-2023. Clairement, le gouvernement canadien est prêt à faire sa part. Ensemble, avec nos partenaires des provinces et des territoires, nous allons donc continuer de retrousser nos manches, saisir cette opportunité historique et livrer ensemble des résultats dans le meilleur intérêt des Canadiennes et des Canadiens. Together with our partners from provinces and territories, 
we can deliver results in the best interest of all. Thank you, merci, and I will now turn to Dr. Dr. Bennett. Oh, I mean, yeah, I think so. Dr. Bennett. Merci, uh, Minister Duclos, and je voudrais commencer en reconnaissant que cette annonce a lieu sur le territoire non cédé des peuples algonquins, and I would like to thank Monsieur Charbonneau and the University of Toronto and also for your beautiful land acknowledgement, um, but of course the Ottawa Nursing School for hosting us today. Uh, Canadians are truly grateful uh, for the selfless and life-saving work that nurses have done throughout the pandemic, and we thank you and all of those working in our healthcare systems, but I was particularly inspired by the amazing instructors that we saw across the way in terms of how they're attracting um, great people to want to be nurses and inspiring them um, to stay and, and uh, take on the challenges um, that we know nurses um, and all healthcare providers have faced uh, in these past two years. So I too want to recognize not only Minister Duclos and uh, Minister Cara, but of course uh, um, our fearless leader uh, in Ottawa, uh, Minister Fotti. And I, I too want to acknowledge uh, MP Hanley, as you know, as the Chief Medical Officer of Health for the territory of the Yukon. He has uh, been uh, an amazing uh, um, inspiration for us on the opioid crisis and on so many other things within the Mental Health Caucus as co-chair. So uh, thank you, MP Hanley. As we all know, um, the last two years have been incredibly difficult. Um, the, we've experienced unprecedented social disruption, uh, the loss of loved ones, uh, concerns for the well-being of friends and family members, and in many cases, financial challenges. We recognize that almost 50% of Canadians and Indigenous peoples have been reporting increased less levels of stress and anxiety. And as, as Minister Duclos said yesterday in question period, and to two thirds to three quarters of healthcare providers have felt those real stresses. So it, it, COVID-19 uh, pandemic has indeed confirmed that the mental health and substance use needs of far too many people in Canada have gone unmet for far too long. And this is extremely true for the 2SLGBTQQIA plus community, BIPOC community, and young, young people. So today, Minister Duclos highlighted the improving mental health and substance use services, one of the key priorities of our plan to strengthen health and healthcare in Canada and to improve the health of Canadians and First Nations, Inuit and Métis. We, while we build the systems bottom up to support Canada's mental health and substance use, we recognize that this will require a holistic approach across all government departments. As Minister Duclos outlined the priorities, we know that this will, they, they, they will all be important in improving the mental health of Canadians. We know that addressing backlogs, improving access to family health teams, to, to accurate health data and, and supports to age with dignity will be essential in ensuring mental health care, as we know, needs to be a full and equal part of our universal health care system. La législation que nous présentons aujourd'hui est une démonstration de notre engagement à nous assurer que le système de santé reflète véritablement et réponde aux attentes du Canada. Notre gouvernement a re reconnu, reconnu dans la pandémie que des actions immédiates étaient nécessaires pour répondre aux besoins sans président en santé mentale et en consommation de substances de canadiennes avec des transferts spéciaux et des interventions innovantes uh, comme Espace Musette Canada. We know we need to do more. Responding to the increased needs requires structural change, as the minister said, to ensure a sustainable an accountable approach to improve the mental health care and substance use services and outcomes, but to get every, every Canadian the most appropriate care in the most appropriate place by the most appropriate provider at the most appropriate time, and that includes virtual. So thank you, 
Merci, miigwech. I'm uh, very happy to turn the, uh, the parole. Um, my colleague, Minister Kara, as you know, is a nurse. And as we know, um, in the, in the, uh, our, what, inspiration for nursing, Florence Nightingale was a statistician. And I think all three people at this table care desperately about data and, and how that will inc inc improve the outcomes, uh, the health outcomes of all Canadians. So uh, over to you, Minister Kara. Thank you, uh, merci, uh, Dr. Bennett. Uh, first and foremost, let me just take a moment uh, to acknowledge all the incredible healthcare workers, doctors, nurses, and of course, future healthcare workers that have joined us today. Uh, you are our country's heroes and continue to fight on the front lines day in and day out. And we cannot thank you enough for all that you've done and you continue to do. As the minister mentioned, we have learned some hard truths about ourselves and our social support systems in Canada over the past two years. While the pandemic has affected us all, we know that COVID-19 has had disproportionate impact on our vulnerable populations, including seniors. The last two years have been incredibly difficult for Canadians. We've seen an increase in stress, anxiety, depression, and loneliness since the beginning of, beginning of this pandemic. Most notably, we have witnessed the profound impact of social isolation, particularly to the mental health and well-being of seniors. As a registered nurse, I've had the privilege to volunteer and return to the front lines at one of the hardest hit long-term care homes uh, in Ontario throughout the pandemic. And I've seen firsthand the critical gaps that the healthcare workers and residents face every day. And I bring those experiences with me every day, of course, as my role as the Minister of Seniors. And as such, one of my most important tasks is to help improve care for seniors, no matter where they live in Canada. The pandemic highlighted systemic issues that affect the delivery of health care. But many of these issues predate COVID-19, including in long-term care homes, gaps in infection, prevention and control, staffing, infrastructure and overall quality of care. We need to protect our seniors. We need to support those seniors who wish to age at home. And we need to support the healthcare workers who are on the front lines supporting seniors and all Canadians. Healthcare providers and patients, including seniors, have deferred many medical procedures over the past two years. Our healthcare system across the country is still facing substantial backlogs that require time and resources to clear. All Canadians should have access to timely surgeries, diagnostics, and age with dignity closer to home. Today's investment will provide provinces, territories, and indeed all healthcare workers with the additional tools and resources to address immediate pandemic-related healthcare pressures. This builds on the work, of course, that is already underway to strengthen supports for long-term care, including the ongoing work with the with the, uh, Minister of Health and I have been doing with provinces and territories to improve the quality and availability of long-term care across Canada. COVID-19 has required an unprecedented effort to support Canada's health care system to get our country through the pandemic. And we've been there for Canadians every step of the way. And now that the recovery from COVID-19 has begun, we have an opportunity to build a better, stronger system to support aging adults and those who care for them in health care and in their communities. Today's announcement reflects our commitment to making permanent systemic changes to Canada's health care system and long-term care system. And this also means addressing our, the mental health of seniors. By acting now, we can ensure that Canadians, including seniors, are protected, protected and have access to timely health care they need and deserve, both now and into the future. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Mesdames et Messieurs les Ministres, pour vos remarques. Nous allons maintenant commencer avec la période des questions. Thank you, Ministers, for your remarks. We will now take questions from the media. We will start with our friends who are here in the room. So if you could just introduce yourself and your outlet and who your question is directed to, and we will go from there. Merci. 
Uh, Glenn McGregor, CTV News. Uh, Minister uh, Duclo, I'm curious about how you think this one-time payment will actually have any effect on clearing these backlogs that were caused by capacity issues during the, the pandemic. I mean, hospitals can't temporarily open extra operating theaters. They can't temporarily hire more surgeons, pathologists, radiologists. How is this really going to make a difference in clearing that backlog if the funding is not sustained, if it's only just a lump? Thank you. And uh, you're correct in pointing to two different things, which is first the short-term challenge and then this, this, the longer-term need to build and, and repair the, uh, the system, in, including, obviously, as you said, investing in, in healthcare workers. We know that there are hundreds of thousands of uh, delayed or canceled surgeries because of COVID-19. That's a short-term objective. We need to, uh, to look after the, the needs of those patients uh, that have suffered and are suffering from, uh, from those delays. That means supporting healthcare workers. That's the only way to care for these patients. And as you said, uh, that requires hard work on the part of provinces and territories. And we appreciate that this is going to be a challenge. And however, we know that this uh, level of support at this time will make a difference. And uh, we know that it's combined also to the other $4 billion that we announced last week uh, exactly for that same purpose. In your list of five priorities, I didn't hear you mention either dental care or pharma care, which are two priorities the NDP has made as a condition of continuing to support your government. Can you commit that in the upcoming federal budget there will be real money for both those programs? Yes, I did mention them uh, after I, uh, I described the five uh, areas of priorities, dental care and reducing the cost of medicine, which is the uh, one of the most important outcomes of, of pharma care. And as you know, but I, I it's important to, re, to, to, to perhaps to be even more clear on, we have committed to working on the, with the NDP on making sure that these two pieces of our collective agenda also move forward. And that when, as, as it comes to the budget, well, we'll know what is in the budget when the budget will be uh, made public. Deux questions en une. À quand le début des négociations avec les provinces? Et deuxièmement, quand vous parlez des, de vos cinq priorités, est-ce qu'on peut parler de cinq conditions? Les provinces devront mettre l'argent qui leur sera alloué par le fédéral dans ces cinq priorités. Est-ce que ce sont des conditions? Merci pour la question. Première question, le quand? Deuxième, le quoi? Mais sur le quand, écoutez, on est ensemble et c'est très important de le de, de comprendre pourquoi et d'en reconnaître les bienfaits depuis deux ans, évidemment plus que deux ans, mais durant deux ans, on a vécu euh, non seulement une période historique dans l'histoire de la santé publique euh, euh, au Canada, mais aussi une période historique en matière de relations entre les provinces, les territoires et le gouvernement canadien. Et on a pu démontrer que cette relation pouvait mener à des euh, avantages majeurs pour les Canadiens incluant évidemment les Québécois. Donc, cette, cette relation se poursuit. Elle a été extraordinairement intense depuis deux ans. Euh, Moi-même, j'ai participé à plusieurs rencontres avec mes, mes collègues ministres de la Santé des provinces et des territoires, que je remercie d'ailleurs pour cette, cette collaboration qui donne beaucoup de, de fruits. Donc, cette collaboration continue. Elle est en, en place depuis déjà euh, deux ans d'une manière extrêmement intense et on sait qu'elle va devoir le, continuer à être intense au cours des prochains mois et des prochaines années. La deuxième chose, c'est sur le quoi. Bien, les domaines de priorité que j'ai résumés sont des, des, des domaines de priorité sur lesquels tout le monde s'entend. On se parle depuis déjà plusieurs mois et c'est ce qui ressort. C'est que partout à travers le pays, ce sont les domaines de priorité euh, dans lesquels les provinces et les territoires veulent investir et pour lesquels on a déjà signalé dans la plateforme électorale en septembre dernier que le gouvernement canadien voulait aussi investir. Donc, est-ce qu'il y aura des conditions spécifiques? Est-ce que les provinces seront tenues d'allouer l'argent supplémentaire que vous allez leur donner éventuellement dans des domaines spécifiques? Monsieur, Monsieur Legault, cette semaine, a déjà dit que vous allez frapper un nœud s'il y a des conditions. Bon, la règle des trois R, les trois R, la règle des trois, la règle des trois R est très extrêmement importante ici. Laissez-moi résumer cette règle des trois R. Le premier R, pour éviter toute confusion, est très clair. Le respect des juridictions. Le gouvernement canadien ne peut pas prétendre, il ne voudra jamais essayer de micro-gérer les services de santé à l'échelle des provinces et des territoires. Le deuxième R, c'est pour la responsabilité partagée. 
La raison pour laquelle on travaille ensemble, c'est qu'on a cette responsabilité partagée. On sert exactement les mêmes citoyens avec exactement les mêmes dollars. Les dollars viennent des mêmes personnes et surtout les patients, les gens, les travailleurs de la santé. On a tous l'obligation, qu'on soit au gouvernement canadien ou dans les gouvernements des provinces et territoires, de les servir au meilleur de nos capacités. Et le troisième R, c'est l'accent sur les résultats. Tout le monde, euh, au Québec y compris, mais certainement aussi à travers le pays, tout le monde insiste sur l'importance de focaliser sur les résultats. C'est ce que les gens veulent et c'est ce qu'on va continuer à faire avec nos collègues, mes homologues des autres euh, niveaux de gouvernement. Abigail Bateman, Global News. Uh, Minister Duclos, following my colleague Glenn's question, uh, you yourself referenced staffing as, as one of the challenges. It, it can't be solved with, with a top-up. Provinces are calling for consistent funding. So I'm wondering how confident you are that uh, this $2 billion will make a difference and whether you have any concrete uh, examples of how the $4 billion that you, that you gave helped, whether there's been you know, shortened backlogs or any numbers like that. So let me briefly present the, the whole, the, the broader um, transfer package, investment package. So we've got the Canada Health Transfer, which is in, on April the 1st going to move uh, to $45 billion. Then we have the, uh, I would call the triple uh, three uh, agreements on which we will be working with provinces and territories uh, very soon. We've already started conversations, which is on long-term care, mental health, and home care. Then there is the $63 billion uh, that the federal government has been investing and is continuing to invest in, in fighting uh, COVID-19. And in addition to that, there is the $4 billion and the $2 billion, uh, which are targeted to addressing the urgent need to reduce backlogs of surgeries and, and treatments and diagnostics. So these, these are big dollars, obviously, but more importantly, these are or hundreds of thousands of people that will be helped. Now, uh, reducing a, a, a backlog surgery is not only obviously important for the, the health of the person, but also for his or her family. Now, everyone that cares from him, for him or for her. It's also important for healthcare workers. They have been stressed mentally and physically because they just don't have the resources that they need to look appropriately enough for those patients that they love and that they want to look after. So it's, 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 it's essential, it's a, it's a, as you said, it's a quick, important investment and it's, it's, on, it's, it's moving us on the path to this longer term collaboration that we need to have between all levels of government. With respect, you, you didn't speak to whether you have evidence that the first $4 billion actually shortened any backlogs, but for my follow-up, uh, your campaign promised an immediate $6 billion to address the backlog on top of that $4 billion. So I'm wondering if the $2 billion today, if that's it, or is there another $4 billion coming? Because again, the language in the campaign was immediately. That's right. So immediately $2 billion. No, we know where this is, because it's a... Uh, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a challenge for uh, our colleagues in provinces and territories. Now, that's why this immediate uh, investment is going to help my, our health colleagues, our health minister's colleagues in various parts of Canada do what they want to do. And, and they sometimes need uh, the resources, the financial resources needed to, for that to happen. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a support that we as uh, health ministers and, and ministers of seniors are providing to our colleagues in provinces and territories to enable them to invest more and more quickly in uh, addressing those backlogs. Hi, Christy Kirkup with the Globe and Mail. Um, I just wanted to pivot back to the agreement between the government and the NDP for a second, specifically on dental care. The Canadian Dental Association has called for money to be handed over uh, to the provinces whereas the NDP has called for the creation of a federal program. So where do you stand, Minister? Uh, let me come back briefly to the agreement with the NDP. That agreement is great news for Canadians, and particularly great news for the health and healthcare needs of Canadians. We are going to work faster and in, in the right direction with that agreement. It's going to remove a lot of the uncertainty that has no, plagued uh, some of the last um, while. So as we work with the NDP, we'll, we'll uh, obviously uh, 
collaborate with them, listen to them, and also work with many other uh, partners and, and certainly many stakeholders in Canada who are very much interested in making uh, those commitments work for Canadians. So there is a lot, work, a, lot, a lot of work to do, but there is again a good news that we are going to proceed more speedily, more effectively on the road to better health care for Canadians, including dental care and pharma care. But do you envision it as being a here's the money for the provinces or a federal program? And just I'll, I'll pivot to one other thing if you could address that, I appreciate it. Um, you're setting out some stipulations for um, the uh, boost of health care transfers to the provinces. You're, you're making it clear what Ottawa's expectations are. Um, how do you think these expectations are going to go over with the provinces who have articulated that they need this immediate injection now and frankly kind of feel as though they've been begging Ottawa to pony up this additional uh, cash? Well, uh, two things. First, on what we've done together and second, on expectations. So what we've done together has been extremely significant over the last two years. Now, in addition to the Canada Health Transfer, you know, which is now 45, 63 billion dollars more. That's in addition to the 45 billions. And we're not even speaking of the other investment that I mentioned earlier. So these are major investments, but they were there for the right reason. The Kenyan government did the right thing, had to do the right thing. So it's not because of generosity, it's because of necessity that the federal government did those things, uh, knowing that a lot of the hard work has to be done by provinces and territories on the ground. Now, in terms of expectations, what, I've, what we have outlined earlier, the five uh, areas of priorities, these are recognized as areas of priorities by everyone that we've talked to and we've listened to. You know, this is as in the topic of conversations between Carolyn, myself, and, um, and uh, Kamal uh, for many weeks and months now with our colleague, colleagues from provinces and territories, and, and in addition with many uh, stakeholders, healthcare workers, such as the ones we have with us today. So it's it's universally it's a universal consensus, which I don't know it means. Uh, it's a, cons it's a very strong consensus. So it's uh, and it's great that it's a strong consensus because it's going to enable us to move faster. <laughs> Euh, mais est-ce que les priorités que vous évoquez aujourd'hui, si les provinces n'y adhèrent pas, est-ce que ça pourrait être plus difficile pour elles de conclure une entente sur les transferts en santé en fait, au, au, avec le fédéral? Bien, à nouveau, ce sont des domaines de priorité qui sont partagés par l'ensemble de mes collègues, des ministres de la Santé à travers le pays, et en plus qui sont appuyés par beaucoup d'experts et aussi naturellement et de manière importante par les travailleurs euh, de la santé à travers le pays. Donc, euh, on, a, on annonce ça aujourd'hui parce qu'on sait qu'il y a consensus autour de ça. Maintenant, ce qu'il faut faire, c'est travailler ensemble solidement parce que nos défis sont importants. Et il faut qu'on y arrive, il faut qu'on arrive à traiter ces défis-là de manière la plus euh, efficace, incluant à long terme. Et vous l'avez dit, le système de santé partout au Canada est à risque, on l'a vu pendant la pandémie. Pourquoi établir ce genre de discussion-là et, et à la place de tout simplement transférer cet argent-là? Il y a urgence. Là, de la Colombie-Britannique jusqu'au Nouveau-Brunswick, il y a urgence dans les systèmes de santé, vous le reconnaissez. Pourquoi passer par ce genre de processus-là au lieu de carrément transférer, passer à 22-35 comme les provinces le demandent? Pourquoi oui. encore allonger le processus? C'est une poursuite. Hein? Donc, quand je parlais du... Euh, du 63 milliards déjà investis, il y a beaucoup de cet argent-là qui, qui n'est pas encore euh, ou bien transféré ou bien dépensé. Euh, on parle des tests rapides, des, des vaccins, des traitements antiviraux, tout ça, là, c'est et des, des ententes qu'on a conclues avec certaines, avec, des ententes, certaines ententes qu'on a conclues avec, avec les provinces et territoires au cours des derniers mois. Ce sont des, des transferts et des investissements qui se poursuivent. Il n'y a, a pas de coupure euh, aujourd'hui parce qu'on annonce quelque chose d'autre. Donc, c'est une, une poursuite des investissements. Quand je faisais référence tout à l'heure aux, aux, aux ententes et aux investissements en matière de soins à domicile et en santé mentale, c'est une poursuite des travaux et des succès qu'on a pu voir depuis 2017 et que ma collègue Caroline va vouloir continuer à, à développer. Et en plus, bien, on a 4 milliards euh, annoncés en mars dernier, un autre 2 milliards euh, présentement, parce qu'on sait que sur la question des, 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 des délais 
euh, en matière de, de chirurgie, de diagnostic et de traitement, cette question est urgente. Il faut vraiment qu'on qu reconnaisse qu'il y a beaucoup de gens qui nous écoutent aujourd'hui, qui, ou bien eux-mêmes, ou dont les proches, euh, dont, la, dont les membres de famille, ont subi des, des retards ou parfois même des annulations de, de chirurgie ou de diagnostic ou de tests. Moi-même, euh, il y a à peu près un an, là, je ne vais pas parler trop de moi parce que ce n'est pas tellement important, mais il y a moi-même, il y a un an, quand j'ai eu un enjeu de santé physique, j'ai attendu probablement un peu trop longtemps avant d'aller consulter et j'ai eu de la chance parce que j'ai été bien, j'en suis bien sorti, mais j'ai hésité parce que je me suis dit, bien, il y a des délais, il y a des... des T'sais, on ne sera pas capable de prendre soin de moi. Il y a déjà des gens qui sont là, qui ont besoin de soins, c'est clair. Alors moi, est-ce que j'ai vraiment besoin d'aller consulter? Est-ce que je peux ne pas plutôt laisser les gens qui, ont, qui sont déjà sur place profiter des soins dont ils ont besoin? Alors, il y a beaucoup de personnes comme moi qui ont fait ce même, même genre de raisonnement. Il y a beaucoup de travailleurs de la santé qui savent euh, qu'il faut euh, mieux prendre soin de certains patients, mais qui n'ont pas les ressources, n'ont pas le temps n'ont pas les, la capacité de le faire et ça affecte leur, leur santé, euh, évidemment, leur, leur stress et leur, leur sentiment de satisfaction dans leur milieu de travail. Minister Laura Osmond, the Canadian Press. I wanted to switch topics quickly to ask you about Medicago. The company uh, sent us a statement today that say the WHO has not accepted their application for their COVID-19 vaccine. Canada has agreed to purchase between 20 and 76 million doses. If the WHO is not going to accept this, what are Canada's options for those doses? Do you expect to um, seek individual deals with specific countries to donate them, or do you expect to keep them for domestic use? Uh, thank you. Uh, four different uh, brief uh, things on that. The first one is that this is an example, an extraordinary example of success that we've seen in Canada. Uh, on biomanufacturing research and development because of the very high quality of the expertise and the experts on which we base the selection of the seven vaccines that uh, we put in our portfolio in uh, the summer of 2020. So it's, it's remarkable that these experts, and we, we are very grateful to them obviously, were able to signal that Medicago, with, because of its technology, would be likely able to, uh, to, to develop and then to produce a high quality vaccine. The second thing is that this is a very, it's a unique technology. It's a plant-based technology. There is no other vaccine in the world uh, that was able to uh, rely on that technology. And we are told by experts that te that technology can be useful for not only future variants of COVID-19, but future other types of future pandemics. The third thing, is that we want and we wish that uh, vaccine and that technology to be useful uh, in places other than Canada. We want other human beings to benefit from that technology, not only Canadians. We know that Health Canada has approved that vaccine because of its very high uh, level of safety and its incredible uh, level of efficiency. But we know that it could be and should be uh, uh, useful outside of Canada for non-Canadians. And the fourth thing is that Minister Champagne and, uh, and myself as well, Minister Champagne has been closely working with the, with the company and, and, and also in touch with the WHO to make sure that we can move beyond that uh, initial decision. This was a decision based for emergency use, but there are other avenues uh, that uh, Medicago uh, in support Uh, with, uh, by the by Minister Champagne, and the other avenues that we can use uh, to make sure that we are heading in the right direction. And my colleague is asking if you can repeat that last bit uh, en français, please. It's a long response. I don't know if you want to. What No, no, Medicago is the beginning of a great history of success in Canada and in my region of Quebec. Et euh, une histoire de succès parce que, un, c'est une technologie euh, extraordinairement euh, utile, euh, deux, utile dans le contexte de la COVID-19, euh, deux, c'est une technologie qui pourrait, euh, en fait, c'est une technologie qui est unique, qui pourrait aussi s'appliquer à d'autres types de pandémies et s'appliquer aussi à des variants qu'on ne connaît pas encore de la COVID-19. Et trois, bien, le ministre Champagne euh, et moi-même, et le ministre Champagne mène ça euh, avec, euh, avec beaucoup d'énergie, Uh, on travaille avec la compagnie Medicago et avec uh, l'OMS 
pour s'assurer qu'on puisse aller au-delà de cette décision qui repose sur un usage euh, d'urgence euh, du vaccin et sur des raisons reliées à la structure corporative de la compagnie. Donc, ça n'a rien à voir avec la qualité du vaccin, qui est extraordinairement bonne, à la fois d'un point de vue sécurité et efficacité. Il y a peu d'autres vaccins qui performent aussi bien sur la base des tests cliniques, et on veut que ce soit non seulement les Canadiens, mais aussi les étrangers qui puissent en profiter au cours des prochains mois et des prochaines années. So, are there any discussions happening um, in government about seeking individual deals with, gover with other governments to donate them, or do you expect, are you talking about maybe incorporating them into Canada's uh, vaccine strategy? Well, there are several avenues. First, it's, it will be soon available to Canadians. That's a good thing. Uh, second, it, uh, we know and certainly hope that it will be available as quickly as, as is possible to non-Canadians. And third, COVID-19 is not over. There will be other variants, there will be other waves, and therefore we need to protect against those new variants and those new waves. Protecting means um, uh, enlarging the set of tools that we will be able to draw on when these new variants and these new waves will come, including for other types of pandemics that may arise in the future. That's why our strategy works so well in Canada when we had these seven vaccines in our portfolio. We knew that if there was one or two or maybe even three that wouldn't work, we could rely on the four others. Now, the, the wonder, the, the, the incredible story is that out of these seven vaccines that experts invited us to focus on, six of them have been approved by Health Canada, six out of seven. So fortunately, we didn't focus all our energies on the one that we have for which we don't have success yet, but we had six others. So that's great because it, 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 it reduced, obviously, the risk and in, improved significantly our ability to deliver quickly vaccines across Canada. Again, we need to be mindful that the pandemic is not over. There will be new variants, and that's why this significant success with risk managing the vaccine production, procurement, administration needs to continue. Merci. Merci à tous. Thank you for the questions in-house. We will now turn to Zoom. On va passer aux questions sur Zoom. Donc, je passe la parole à Marc, qui va modérer la période des questions virtuelles. Merci. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Um, if you're a reporter and wish to ask a question, please use the hand raising function. And we ask that you limit yourself to one question and one follow up. Si vous êtes journaliste et vous désirez poser une question, vous utilisez l'option de lever la main. Mais si vous limitez à une question et un suivi. Our first question comes from Jacques Gallant of the Toronto Star. Please go ahead, Jacques. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, Minister Duclos, I heard what you said about these being areas of priorities for everyone for the provinces, but will the provinces have to explicitly commit to spending in these areas uh, in order to access further increases in funding from the federal government? So I think you're asking about uh, conditionality. We're speaking, yes. to, we're speaking today about uh, areas of, of priorities around which there is uh, total consensus. Uh, and Minister uh, Bennett, Minister Kerra uh, have also signaled how not only important it is to, uh, to act and to proceed on those, uh, those priorities, but how, how broad the, uh, the support is across Canadians, across stakeholders, and indeed across our uh, partners from provinces and territories. So that's the, the good news now. It's also the good news for the future, because we know, and, and, and we will make sure that this happens, we know that this consensus is going to continue because we all face uh, not only severe, but broad challenges across Canada. And I might turn to Minister Kera or Minister Bennett, if you want to add something. I think um, in terms of mental health, I think we've heard um, from across the country uh, that they want this system built bottom up. I think we have heard, as Minister Duclos said, um, the example of childcare raised very often. Um, the fact that people do want to make sure the money goes to mental health and substance use programming. Um, there was $5 billion uh, um, that, that over 10 years for the provinces and territories for, for mental health. Uh, 
uh, and now we hope to have another 4.5, but I think that m people do want to know about data and outcomes, and I think that that, that is certainly the what I'm hearing um, from bottom up across the country on what would eventually end up as a mental health transfer. Thanks, and um, actually my second question is to you, uh, Minister Bennett, and it's on the um, health exemptions from, uh, well, from Vancouver and Toronto, and I'm wondering, has the government looked at a potential exemption for the entire country? Should one of these exemptions be approved, people in these cities would be living in an area where, you know, simple possession is no longer a criminal offense, but what about people living in the rest of the country? So, as you know, um, the, the Office of the Public Prosecution has already given very strict guidance or recommendations that people should not be charged for simple possession uh, for personal use. And so we are not seeing people being charged. Um, and I think that it's what we're doing right now and working very hard with the province of British Columbia um, as well as as the city of Vancouver and uh, more recently the city or the public health board of Toronto is to 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 put in place uh, a, a program that would be implementable um, with very strong research component to make sure that what we do is indeed saving lives and is indeed um, not recriminating um, or recriminalizing um, people using drugs. So this is a, this is a, a first step um, as, as uh, in the proposal for the exemption. And then there's exceptions to the exemption. If, um, and those are the kinds of things that are, that are, we're working through now around schools, around motor vehicles, around parks, that, uh, that we are going to, we're working very hard to get this right. Thank you. I believe that we have the time for one more question. Je crois qu'on aura le temps pour une autre question qui vient de Milan Cret de la presse. Oui, bonjour, Monsieur Duclos. J'aimerais savoir euh, le 2 milliards de dollars là, pour euh, réduire les listes d'attente pour les chirurgies. Est-ce que une province pourrait décider d'affecter cet argent-là à d'autres priorités? Euh, bien, merci pour la question. Et la réponse est, est simple. Nous avons la confiance totale que, avec ce qu'on observe partout au pays en matière de retard dans les chirurgies, les diagnostics et les traitements. Donc, une confiance totale que les provinces et les territoires vont vouloir utiliser cet argent pour réduire ces, ces, ces délais et ces, et, ces, et ces retards. Donc, c'est à, à suivre, mais à nouveau, je crois que les besoins étant très élevés, c'est ce que les provinces et les territoires vont vouloir faire. faire. Et qu'est-ce qui arrive pendant la campagne électorale fédérale? Il y avait été question d'une loi sur les soins de santé sécuritaires pour les aînés. Est-ce que c'est toujours dans les cartons? Bien, on travaille ensemble et le leadership est, euh, est partagé avec la ministre Kera pour, euh, pour donc deux choses. La première, c'est euh, s'assurer que nos aînés vivent dans la dignité et la sécurité. Et ça, ça prend des ressources additionnelles du gouvernement canadien. Et la deuxième chose, c'est pour... Euh, avec des experts externes, développer des, des standards qui, pourraient, qui pourront être utilisés par les provinces et territoires pour améliorer les conditions de vie euh, des aînés. Mais pour pouvoir euh, améliorer euh, les conditions de vie, ça prend du financement et le gouvernement canadien a besoin de faire sa part. Et c'est ce qu'on va faire avec le 3 milliards de dollars dont j'ai parlé brièvement un peu plus, un peu plus tôt. Merci. À vous, Marjolaine. Merci beaucoup. C'est ce qui m'a fait la conférence de presse pour aujourd'hui. That'll be all for today's press conference. Thank you.